Thank you for joining us. The webinar will commence in two minutes. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Catherine Austin, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Fathom Maritime Intelligence to this afternoon's session on ship performance management. This webinar is part of an ongoing series of free-to-access monthly webinars that Fathom is hosting throughout 2016. Today's webinar will run for one hour, with three experts presenting for 10 minutes each. Once all speaker presentations are complete, there will be a 15-minute question and answer session. For this question and answer session, we invite you to post any questions into the chat tool throughout the duration of the webinar. You'll find this on the, the right-hand side um, of the, the, the webinar um, tool. I will then put those received questions to our speakers. However, please note that due to the limited time we may have for this final session, uh, we may not be able to put all, speakers, all questions received from the speakers. However, we can arrange for any questions to be answered by the speakers after the webinar. For now, with those admin points out of the way, I'd like to introduce our lineup of speakers. Our first speaker for today will be the Global Sales Director at Yoten, Stein Kohlberg, who will discuss the value of performance data analysis. Then, the Area Sales Manager at VAF Instruments, Edwin Schurink, will discuss hull and propeller efficiency monitoring. Our final speaker for the session will be the CEO of Techno Veritas, Dr. George Atunez who will examine digested data to access fleet performance. Gentlemen, I thank you for joining us today. For now, let's get started. I would like to hand over to our first speaker, Stein Kohlberg from Yoten. Over to you, Stein. Thank you, Catherine, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, we are very happy to be part of such a webinar and, and talk about one of our favorite topics. Um, ship performance has been on the agenda over the past couple of years and really grown in importance. Uh, and as a paint company, we of course have to take our part in this. We have a quite narrow view on this and we have focused only on the things that we are able to, to have. Um, if I look into really what is um, the importance here, um, and how the propeller if this switches there. Um, the hull and propeller performance uh, has been documented through several uh, important um, uh, important papers uh, among the ones submitted to IMO as a basis for an ISO standard. And it's documented that hull and propeller performance actually is a ship efficiency killer and accounts for roughly 10% of the world fleet fuel cost and GHG emissions. And you can put some numbers on this, and it all depends on what oil price you use. But we indicated in the first document that roughly $30 billion in additional fuel cost was a result of this deterioration in hull and propeller performance. We also know that there's a lot of good products out in the market, covering the whole range from the most advanced sophisticated to the less performance ones. Uh, but still, we see a lot of bad performance on vessels coming in. And the question is, why does the performance remain poor? And first and foremost, this goes to the fact that there's a lack of measurability. Today, there's a lot of claims in the market on uh, fuel savings, a number of percent. But how to actually measure that is, is highly unsophisticated. It's difficult to say that a good antifouling will give you a direct saving in fuel, because what is fuel saving? There's so many factors into this. And that leads to another challenge. That means for the owners. If they really can't measure return on their investment, that investment has really no value unless they know what to invest in and they can compare that to a substantial improvement, then it's hard, very difficult. 
This means that the paint maker's dilemma is very simple. If you can't prove what we're doing, we then have to rely all the, all the, the things we do on marketing and use fantastic uh, international jargons, etc. So this is something that we have worked on for a long time. And the result on this work that's taken place more than five years now is what we call the whole performance solutions. And this concept is basically consisting of four different pillars. It's a product, it's technical service, it's performance monitoring, and it's performance guarantee on top of that. And all this combined means that we actually have changed it into what we call uh, measurable performance, not just paint. And we'd like to try to change the industry a bit here. Because what's in the technology is not really the important stuff. The point is, what can that product or technology deliver to what expectation of our clients? So if you then take this a bit further, how is it possible to measure? How is it possible to be accountable? And how is it possible to deliver on this service? Well, we have documented this through several ways. Um, and one here is what we call the whole performance monitoring basic idea. Um, we have defined that in order to measure performance, looking at the speed loss of a vessel over time actually gives a very accurate indication on the performance on the hull and the propeller. And the way we do this is to look into how much, uh, how much more or less power that's required to move this ship through water at a given speed. And that can be attributed to the change in condition of the underwater hull and the propeller. And by using the link speed and power over time, uh, and using the torque meter on the shaft and the speed through water as a, as a baseline, we're able to exclude a lot of the factors that influences the fuel consumption, but not really the actual performance of the hull and anti falling part. We are looking at the deviation in speed given at uh, a given shaft power. So that means if the ship is losing power, speed given a, a fixed power, that means there has happened something on the hull or the propeller. Um, and what we then do, we look on the ship over a five-year period and we see how much is that speed loss versus the benchmark period initially and the actual performance of the full five-year period. Our focus is on the long-term changes. This is not an operational tool that focuses on uh, changes you can do immediately on the ship. We, we basically look into how well has the anti-filing or the hull condition improved the performance over time. And this methodology has also been the starting point for the ongoing work on the ISO standard, which is in this uh, or draft international standard called ISO 19030. Um, the point with this standard was to recommend practical methods for measuring changes in ship-specific hull and propeller performance. And this to be used on a voluntary basis. It's not meant to be mandatory. It's all meant to be in such a way that if you want to measure performance, well, this is a common way to do it. Uh, it has been defined a lot of different um, parameters that we have to comply to, so it doesn't matter what kind of anti-filing system you have, what kind of measurability tool you have, or data log you have, as long as you can measure it with the same KPIs. The scope has been to look at four different things over a ship's uh, lifetime between two dry dockings. One is the actual dry dock in performance, comparing the condition of the vessel coming into dry dock and then leaving the dry dock. And then over two docking periods, you can then compare the out docking situation between two dry docks and also then see the impact, the importance of a spot blast on a hull or a full blast on a hull. Secondly is to look at the in-service performance. How good is the performance over time or how bad is that performance over time? By looking at this, it's also possible to see if there's any immediate changes in the deviation to the performance. So if there's a sudden drop in this performance, that should trigger some ad hoc maintenance. It could mean that you look at the propeller. Uh, if that is damaged or, or, um, uh, or, or something else, then you have to look at the propeller. But if it's fouled, okay, then there's an issue with the fouling. Secondly, it would be then to look at the hull. And if you need to do a cleaning, well, that uh, is an indication in, in how this, this measurability is being done. Then fourthly, having done this ad hoc maintenance, it's then possible to look into how much has the performance improved over time. And I'll try to illustrate this a little bit better by, by these sketches. The first one is the in-service performance. And this is then looking into the average change over time. 
So the red line you will see here is the initial performance, let's say the first 12 months of a vessel leaving the dry dock or leaving a new building yard. And it's been established then as a certain performance level. Let's call that R. And then we measure that performance up against the remaining lifetime of the sailing period of that dry docking period. And then we look into the deviation. And this deviation is then measured as an average speed loss. And the best performance we've seen today is around 0.5% speed loss, while the average performance across all technologies, all vessel types, is around 5.9 to 6% speed loss. So of course, any improvement from that market average or any improvement from the previous technology into new technology will definitely be an improvement in performance for the owner. Could be improvement in speed, could be improvement in, in earnings, or it could be improvement in fuel consumption. So this will then determine the effectiveness of the underwater hull and propeller solution. Secondly, we will have the actual drawback in performance. Looking at the condition of a vessel coming in, then doing all the necessary work in the dry dock, meaning a spot blast, full blast, uh, application of the paints, etc., and then to see how much has that that performance changed when leaving the dry dock. Uh, this one has nothing to do with the actual anti-fouling. It's basically showing how good the work in the in the dry dock yard was done, and to prove how much improvement is possible to do. You can also then justify um, if an owner is considering should I do a spot blast or should I do a full blast. And these indications will clearly give a, a, a sort of return on investment case, see that sometimes it actually makes sense to full blast the vessel every five years because that improvement is quite dramatic. So this is then really determining the effectiveness of that dry docking. Thirdly, as a maintenance trigger, when we have established a baseline and we look at the performance over time and we see a sudden drop, then something has to be done. You might wonder all these gray dots on the screen. Well, these dots are uh, high frequency readings taken from several sensors on board a vessel through a data logging uh, equipment, meaning a normal computer, and is input into average, uh, daily averages over the full period. So that means if you see a drastic change, that means something has happened. It could be a propeller or it could be the hull. And that means some kind of uh, rectification work needs to be done. And it's then possible to trigger when to do so. You don't have to wait until the vessel is coming into dry dock again because you'll have a much better understanding of what's actually happening. And the last one is, of course, to measure that effect. So when you have done something, and in this case you will see that the red line uh, mentioned R sh shows the end period of a really bad performance drop. So having done this work, it's now been improved again and you can continue to follow this vessel. So the last part here is really to see how effective was that cleaning. And we have seen on, on a lot of cases on vessels we have followed, both with FRC technology and other technologies, that certain technologies need to be frequently um, cleaned, and more and more frequently, the longer the saving period is. And it then also goes back to the owner to really put this into the perspective. Does it make sense to go for an average anti filing system and clean it pre often, or should I go for a more expensive system and avoid all these cleanings? So all this will be put into a, a, a system, and hopefully this ISO standard will make it easier for all uh, operators in the market to actually follow the same kind of thought, and then make the qualified decisions to have the best possible performance suited to their operation and their needs. A few words about this, this ISO standard. This has been a work ongoing for a long time. And we are now at almost the closing stages. Now, so far, 53 experts representing the whole marine industry has been present. We have from ship owners, ship builders, class societies, various paint makers, performance monitoring companies, research institutions, etc. And these guys have invested more than 12,000 hours over three years in really reviewing and achieving consensus on the drafts. By October last year, all the three parts in this standard, where part one is the general principles, part two would be the default standard that really gives the high accuracy, high frequency readings, and where part three is all the alternative methods if uh, the ship does not have all the necessary sensors installed. So all these three parts were submitted to the ISO committee, Marine Environmental Service Committee, uh, and it's now into a ballot station, a ballot session. So if everything goes as planned, 
we could have the final balloting done by March, and, and an ISO standard officially is issued uh, shortly after. By having this or draft international standard already out, it's possible now for all owners and operators to use this. So because the documents are officially available, and to try to start to, to use this and verify and get familiar with this, it makes a lot of sense. So what's the idea with this? What will this standard actually lead to? Well, first of all, it means that for an owner looking into one ship or a fleet of ships, having data historically would make it possible for them to learn from the past and make better decisions for tomorrow. Could have chosen very good solutions and could have chosen bad solutions or low-cost solutions. And having looked into them, the actual performance level and what the impact is, then the right decisions can be made for the future, more qualified decisions. Secondly, this provides a much needed transparency between buyers and sellers on fuel savings. We will avoid all the claims on fuel savings in percent, but we can more accurately document the actual performance. And it's even possible to guarantee performance on various levels. So that means we don't try to blind the market with technical jargons. We base it on facts and we can prove performance to our, our clients. And lastly, it also means that it would be possible to uh, establish sort of uh, performance-based contracting. So if in a charter contract today, where speed and fuel consumption has been sort of vaguely uh, defined, it would be possible to be more uh, strict, more sharp on describing the vessel. And hopefully for the tonnage provider to get the higher charge rate, or at least show a better performance, so that they are pro the proven uh, tonnage provider for this charter based on their excellent performance. We can even bring in the new building yards in this to follow a vessel from the new building stage until it's actually scrapped 25, 30 years later. So it should be a win-win-win scenario for all parties involved, from the technical providers supplying the right technology for the tonnage providers, the owners that actually use the vessels, and the charters hiring them in. And just to illustrate an example, we have a couple of cases that I'd like to quickly show to you. And this is what we call the good, the bad, and the ugly, or the good, the not so bad, and the really bad. And if we then look into the, the basic here, is the market average performance for an average anti-firing today over five years is around 5.9% speed loss. This is based on more than 120 docking intervals, different vessel types, different coatings. And in order to justify or, 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 uh, or uh, compensate for a 1% speed loss, if you want to maintain that speed, you need to increase the fuel or the power by three times as much. So putting it into perspective, let's have a look at the first one, which is the ugly case. And here you will see the red line is the benchmark period, and the black line is the remaining three and a half years of performance. So in total, this is a four and a half years performance. The average speed loss in this case was 6.4%. The expected impact, or the estimated impact on the fuel bill were roughly 19%. And in this case, that meant roughly $2 million in additional fuel cost for this, this vessel. Secondly, it's a much better performance, where you have an average speed loss of 2.7%. Uh, much improved, and the impact on the fuel bill now is, is uh, only 8%, and this is among the better technologies you'll find in the market today. So over a similar period, this means roughly $850,000 an additional fuel cost. That's a $1 million saving versus the ugly one. Well, the last one, which we call the best one, is over again four and a half years period, where the average speed loss is around 0.4%. This is as good as you will get it in the market today. And the impact on the fuel bill is only 1.5% in this case. The fuel bill would be only 160,000 increase of the wholesaling interval. So what makes this case so interesting? Well, basically, this is because it's the same vessel, measured over three periods. They had the all the necessary equipment, and we have been able to then analyze this over time. And the, the interesting part here, if you just look at the second period and the third period, and the performance improvement potential in this case was as much as $1.8 million, comparing these two uh, scenarios. And of course, for the owner, that is tremendous improvement. And this was not the biggest of vessels. It's a 55,000 David bulk carrier, 
uh, with not that high voltage factor or operation. So this is still a very good performance, and it, it is what you should expect in the market these days. So what am I trying to say? Well, basically now, hollow propeller performance is an important thing to look into. It's not just something the paint companies say, but it has a real impact on performance. We have spoken to owners that have complained about extremely bad performance, and they said that 6% average speed loss, that's way too little. We see much more than that. But it's all about how you measure that. And now we know that quantification is possible. We know that the potential for improvement is considerable. Just from a market average performance and defiling to the best ones that we have seen, you can improve by 13.5% in average. And 13.5% in fuel cost, that's tremendous. And the best part is, of course, the measurements are built on a solid basis for a commercial realization of this potential. So it's not just something we say. It's possible to document in detail. And that ends my short little presentation. I hope that was a value to all of you. Great. Thank you, Stein. That was extremely interesting. Um, and if you have any questions for Stein, um, please, as I said earlier, please put them into the uh, chat tool, um, and we will process them ready for um, them to be put to Stein within uh, the question and answer session. I would now like to hand over to our second speaker, Edwin Schurink. Uh, Edwin is the Area Sales Manager for VAF Instruments. Over to you, Edwin. Thank you, Catherine, for introducing me. And, um, well, I'll start with my first slide. Of course, subject of my presentation is uh, propeller and uh, hull fouling and uh, hull and propeller efficiency monitoring. But first of all, I'd like to introduce to you uh, a very uh, famous captain. I think we all know him. It's uh, Captain Haddock, and he's a little bit surprised because uh, he received his uh, last fuel bill, which, which was uh, very high. And uh, of course, he's surprised because he doesn't have any uh, efficiency monitoring on board of his uh, very old-fashioned uh, vessel. And that's, uh, of course, uh, what's uh, the main subject of my presentation. When you don't like surprises, first of all, start monitoring your efficiency, and especially the hull and propeller efficiency. Um, first of all, also a small introduction of FAF, uh, the company itself. FAF is well known for its products uh, like uh, ViscoSense, which is uh, a, a sensor to measure the viscosity of the fuel, and which is on board of uh, about 70 to 80 percent of all the ships uh, sailing heavy fuel, so that's quite a lot. Of course, FAF is also known from, uh, for some other products, but uh, this presentation, the main subject will be the flow meters, the uh, torque sensor, the thrust and torque sensor, and the FAF monitoring systems. So, combining all these sensors, you can have a FAF efficiency monitoring solution. First of all, the, the FAF torque meter. It's an optical torque meter. It's been introduced to the market in 2010, end of 2010. And the main difference with uh, a lot of other torque meters is that it's, it's an optical system. So you don't have to glue any strain gauges to the shafts, which is a hell of a job. And uh, also for gluing strain gauges, you have to send over a service engineer to some uh, shipyards for example, in uh, very remote areas, so that's uh, a very big advantage. The, the crew or uh, experienced uh, technician can do uh, mounting of the torque sensor himself, and that's also uh, decreasing uh, traveling costs, etc. Another big advantage is that uh, there's no frequent recalibration needed. So when you mount the sensor, you do the zero setting, and then uh, it will stay there uh, for uh, many years. Of course, uh, maybe when you have some quality systems, you have to do uh, recalibration every now and then. But uh, it's not, not uh, having a, a big offset like some uh, strain gauge systems have, because strain gauge systems are glued to the shaft with glue, and the glue can elder, and due to eldering of the glue, you get uh, different outputs than you expected uh, in the beginning. Of the T-Sense, the torque sensor, it's already more than 700 systems sold, so that's quite a lot, and about 60% uh, of them are sold together with uh, the FAF PT2 
flow meters. So that's the positive displacement flow meters. And later on this, uh, in this presentation, I will go into de de details about uh, the optical system, about the detector cell and the LED, which is uh, part of the, uh, the optical uh, torque measurement and the optical thrust and torque measurement system. FAF is also supplying a monitoring system to the market, like I already uh, informed you, uh, about 60% of the T-sensors and TT-sensors are uh, supplied together with a monitoring system. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, one of the big advantages of uh, the monitoring system is that uh, it can combine the FAF PT2 flow meters together with the uh, torque sensor and uh, it can combine all those input signals in one signal processing unit, the one over here. And you also can uh, connect, for example, uh, speed log or GPS inputs or maybe some other signals like uh, sharp power level, uh, 40, 20 milliamp uh, analog uh, signal, etc. The PEM4 monitoring screens, of course, show uh, all the main KPIs like uh, uh, specific fuel oil consumption of uh, the main engine, but also uh, power at the propeller shaft. Uh, the kilograms of fuel per nautical mile and uh, actually there are a lot more screens showing a lot more uh, detailed uh, information and uh, KPIs which you can be interesting, interested in. For example, uh, at this screen over here, the, the PEM4 efficiency monitoring system can show you uh, the fuel consumption of uh, the main engine but also it can show you the cylinder oil, uh, the cylinder oil uh, consumption and uh, the, the fuel consumption of the gensets, for example. And during the last year, we also did some updates. Like over here, we, uh, we, we had already the specific fuel oil consumption of the main engine, but now it's also possible to have the specific fuel oil consumption of the gensets because a lot of uh, big container ships and uh, a lot of big, big other uh, bulkers, tankers, they have uh, at least three or four gensets, which is uh, quite a lot of power. And uh, it's also interesting to monitor those gensets. And in this case, you can see that gensets of the, this vessel are having specific fuel oil consumption of uh, 187 grams per kilowatt hour. And like I already uh, informed you, uh, gensets of a big container ship can be about uh, almost 8 to 10,000 kilowatts altogether. That's also quite a lot of uh, power. Last but not least, we also have uh, an event environmental screen. The screen over here showing you uh, CO2 emissions. And, and as you maybe already know, in 2018, there's a lot of uh, things going to happen because uh, the European Unity is going to introduce a new system to monitor CO2 emissions of, uh, of uh, the vessels uh, above 5,000 uh, gross ton. So that's quite a lot of vessels. And when those ships are in, uh, in harbor in the European territory, they will be obliged to, uh, to administrate their CO2 emissions on the voyage to the harbor but also uh, when the ship is uh, at berth uh, in the harbor and also uh, the CO2 emissions of the next voyage. So what we can do, we can uh, measure the, the fuel consumption of the main engines and the gen set and the boilers. We put it all together and we can calculate the CO2 emissions for you. It's, uh, the emissions over here. And uh, that value is very important uh, for the EU administration. So we're already prepared for 2018 and I think a lot of ship owners will have to think about it also because it's uh, it can be a hell of a job when you have to do it all uh, in a different way. This monitoring system will help you but of course when you don't have fuel meters uh, at uh, the boiler etc and at the gen sets it will be a hell of a job. So this is uh, the main subject of my presentation today. It's the TT sense, the trust and torque meter. It's our next step in, the, in product range and it will enable you to uh, monitor uh, your entire propulsion system. So not only uh, the, the power absorbed by the propeller shaft, but also the result of the power at the propeller shaft and that's the propeller thrust. 
And I will go into some uh, details of this uh, TT Sense because it's uh, quite important to show you that we have uh, designed a very accurate system and that this system can help you to uh, increase your propeller performance and also to uh, detect, for example, uh, hull fouling or maybe propeller fouling. First of all, I'll show you the principle of a torque sensor. I think a lot of people, a few people already know a torque sensor uh, is mounted at, uh, at the shaft and uh, all the torque sensors are connected to the surface of the shafts. What the torque sensors do, they look at uh, the deformation at the surface of the shaft. Uh, for example, in this case, it's called uh, delta Y. And we have a certain deformation at, for example, 200 millimeter distance. You can just uh, calculate uh, the torque at the shaft. Because torque at the shaft is proportional with delta Y, like uh, in the formula over there. So the next step is that uh, we made a sensor capable of measuring the uh, compression of the shaft, compression of the shaft due to thrust, due to propeller thrust. In this case, we're looking at uh, compression, delta X, and delta X is about 5 to 10 micrometer for maximum thrust. And just comparing delta X to delta Y, delta Y for maximum power is about 100 to 150 micrometer. And this delta X is, uh, well, compared to uh, delta Y is very small, only 5 to 10 micrometers. So just imagine when measuring a delta X, you need accuracy, which is 25 nanometers. And 25 nanometers is uh, equal to 5 seconds of beard growth. So that's very small displacement we have to measure. And uh, uh, that's the reason we need a very high accuracy. And of course, there are some other things happening. Also, uh, when the shaft is uh, running and the shaft uh, line bearings are uh, rotating and engine is rotating, uh, the shaft will heat up. And heating up of the shaft will also uh, result in uh, some elongation of the shaft. And we have also take care of that elongation of the shaft. And, uh, well, that's maybe one of uh, the, the, the biggest uh, uh, advantages of our system. We have uh, included uh, eight temperature sensors on the TT Sense. And they are uh, very reliable and capable of... Uh, just dividing the, the thrust measurement and the elongation of the shaft due to a temperature increase. I'll show you a small movie showing uh, the, the principle. I will start it up right now. So this is a container ship having a TT sense on board and uh, the propeller is uh, rotating. In this case, we're going to zoom into the, the TT sense, the, uh, the thrust sensor, and show you what is happening. This is displacement, one more time, this is displacement due to torque, and this is displacement due to thrust. So this one over here is the detector cell, and the other one over there is the LED. LED will illuminate the detector cell, and it's a very accurate detector cell capable of uh, measuring uh, small displacements of up to 25 nanometers. That's, uh, let's say, in a very short story about uh, the, the optical system. And, uh, well, if you have some questions, so please uh, ask them after, after my presentation. One moment. So, what's the advantage of having a TT Sense thrust and torque sensor? I'll show you uh, a ship sailing, let's say a picture of a ship sailing. And as you can see over here, over here is the propeller thrust. So, over here is the, the TT Sense thrust and torque sensor. Uh, over here is the, the thrust, and it's uh, opposite to the resistance of the ship. So, a very big advantage of the TT Sense is that you measure the thrust which is uh, the opposite force of the resistance of the ship when the ship is uh, sailing in stationary condition. 
So also the propeller uh, performance is included in this measurement. For example, you can have a propeller which is performing not that well due to, for example, uh, propeller fouling, or maybe you have a very uh, well, a bended propeller blade or some other influence on the propeller. In this case, when measuring the propeller thrust, you measure directly the resistance of the ship. And that's one of the big advantages of uh, the TT Sense. Another advantage is that it also is able to measure the propeller performance. Because with the TT Sense, you can measure the power at the propeller, but it's also able to measure the result of the power at the propeller, and that's the, the thrust, propeller thrust. So the thrust output value is directly related to, for example, hull roughness, like uh, Steen, he was talking about uh, hull fouling due to, for example, uh, bad uh, hull coatings or uh, maybe old-fashioned hull coatings. With the thrust output uh, measurement, you have a direct indication of the hull roughness, the marine growth, and also maybe there's some uh, seaweed or slime at the side of, your, uh, of, of the hull. Next thing you can measure directly is the quality of the low friction paint and the anti fouling paint. So that's uh, well actually the same subject as uh, a little roughness. When uh, you have a very good uh, anti fouling paint, of course uh, there will not be a lot of marine growth, and uh, you will have a very smooth hull. The other uh, subject uh, which is important when it comes to uh, thrust measurement is uh, with a thrust sensor you measure directly the results of uh, different trim of the vessel. So, for example, when you have the ship in, the, in a very uh, strange trim or wrong trim, the thrust measurement will uh, immediately uh, react to it and show you uh, that the thrust force is more than in the last, uh, in the last uh, situation where you had a different uh, trim. And last but not least, of course, the thrust sensor is able to measure the propeller performance because the thrust sensor can measure the, the power absorbed by the propeller, but it also can measure the uh, propeller thrust of the propeller itself. Real life examples. Uh, first of all, some examples of uh, ships having uh, the TT sense on board. In the, the first case, that's uh, the left part of, uh, of the screen there's a row row ferry that's actually quite a small row row ferry sailing from uh, Bergen to uh, the northern part of Norway. And this row row ferry is equipped with uh, a lot of uh, FAF PT2 flow meters. And also uh, the propeller shafts are equipped with uh, TT sense, thrust, and torque sensors. And I was on board on this ship. It was actually quite a nice trip to the, the northern part of uh, almost to the, the pole circle. And we had installed the PEM4 efficiency monitoring system on the bridge. And this is one of the screens of the efficiency monitoring system at the bridge. As you can see, there's two propellers. This is the port side propeller. The other one is the starboard propeller. And in this case, the ship was uh, uh, sailing uh, one propeller uh, with a combinator curve, so that's uh, this one, and you can see the uh, absorbed power of the propeller was 8.6 megawatt, and the result was, let's say, a little bit more than 800 kilonewton. Uh, the other propeller was sailing, and it was the star pro starboard propeller, was sailing at 6.6 uh, .6 megawatt at the propeller, but the uh, starboard propeller was uh, running constant RPM, and as you can see, the result at the propeller is only 338 kilonewton propeller thrust. So that's quite a big difference. And uh, in this case, you can just conclude that uh, the propeller performance of uh, the port side propeller is twice as good as the propeller performance of the uh, starboard propeller. You can also conclude that uh, this ship should not sail with uh, the propellers in constant RPM uh, when sailing uh, this speed. So that's one uh, example, one uh, real-life example of uh, the advantages of having a thrust measurement system on board. The other one uh, is at uh, the right side of the screen. This is a ship, also uh, a ferry, 
this is a, a bigger one. And this is, ship is sailing, uh, actually is doing quite a lot of uh, harbors. It can do about 10 to 12 harbors per day. And what the people uh, do on board of the, of the ship at the bridge, when they are in the, in near to a harbor, they will uh, decrease the propeller pitch, because this uh, ship is equipped with controllable pitch propellers. And by decreasing the propeller pitch just a little bit, they already are generating negative thrust. You can see over there, I will just uh, show you. Over here is the, the thrust value of the, uh, the port side propeller, which is minus 100, 165 kilonewton. And this is the, the thrust value of uh, the starboard propeller, minus 100 kilonewton. So the propeller is still in forward uh, pitch, but already generating negative thrust. And when you don't have this uh, thrust sensor on board of your ship, you will not notice because when there's no thrust value, there's no uh, monitoring of the thrust, you will not notice what uh, the real uh, propeller performance is. In this case, you're uh, decreasing the speed of your ship and also consuming quite a lot of power and quite a lot of fuel. So that's very, uh, very bad for your overall efficiency of the ship. And uh, as you can see over here, I made some uh, calculations, and this ship is uh, saving about uh, 10 to 15 percent on fuel costs, and that's uh, well when you just compare to a fuel uh, consumption per day, that's about uh, three tons of MGO fuel per day. That's about uh, 1,000 euro a day. So this means that uh, within a year you will be saving more than 350,000 euro on fuel when having this PAM4 efficiency monitoring system and of course when using the system. That's one thing uh, you have to uh, take care about also. Uh, you have to uh, train the crew a little bit that they uh, know what to do and know where to look uh, at the monitoring system. But when they are trained, and uh, it's proven already uh, on board of this ship, they are very, it's very easy to just uh, save fuel more than uh, a few tons a day and uh, well for an enormous amount of uh, 300 or almost 400,000 euro a year which is uh, well actually when you calculate uh, the uh, payback time of this of the ship of the flow meters and the the thrust sensors on the ship payback payback time will only be one or two months which is uh, very very short Some other real-life examples. This is uh, an example of creating awareness on shore. This is a very big container ship equipped with the two-stroke main engine and a very big uh, uh, fixed pitch propeller. And uh, we are now monitoring uh, the propeller performance of this ship, and we also are monitoring uh, the hull performance of the of the same ship. And the project started. Uh, I think a little bit more than one year ago, one and a half year ago, started in April 2014. And as you can see in the on the left part of the screen, there's uh, the, the uh, hull resistance, which we measured on board of the ship, taking of course into account uh, the ship speed and also uh, weather conditions and a lot of other things. And as you can see, the hull resistance is increasing and it's increasing about uh, 4% per year, which is uh, when, uh, when I'm thinking of uh, the presentation of uh, stain, it's not, not really bad, but still, when we just calculate with a very uh, low fuel price, it's still $250,000 extra fuel cost per year, which is uh, quite a lot still. At the other side of the screen, we also uh, have monitored the propeller efficiency, and as you can see over here, propeller efficiency from uh, approximately April 2014 to uh, August 2015 went down with about 2%, 2% uh, actually 2% within one year. And also by monitoring the propeller efficiency, uh, well, it's clear that 2% uh, decrease in propeller uh, efficiency is equal to $125,000 of fuel, also based 
on the very low fuel price, uh, the very low uh, HFO price nowadays. Last not, but not least, there's one thing I uh, have been informed by, by uh, some uh, experts of uh, DNV JL. According experts, the world fleet is sailing with approximately 30% added resistance due to hull fouling. So just imagine 30% added resistance. That's uh, when you just uh, calculate the extra fuel cost for that. That's uh, millions and millions of extra fuel and extra fuel co costs, which is uh, absorbed by uh, by the ship owners. So this was my uh, short presentation, and uh, as you can see, uh, Captain Haddock is uh, very happy uh, that he is now convinced uh, about uh, having a monitoring system, and he's going to check uh, the fouling of the hull right away. I hope he's not going to dive into the water, but he's going to buy uh, a real efficient uh, efficiency monitoring system. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Edwin. Uh, that was really interesting, and, and and thanks for introducing Captain Haddock to the uh, webinar. Um, definitely made me smile. Um, and and we have questions flowing in for, for Edwin, and and if you have any other questions, please put them in the chat tool. But I'm going to move swiftly on uh, to our final speaker um, for this webinar, and it's George Atunes from Techno Veritas. Over to you, George. Hello, good afternoon to all. Uh, thank you very much uh, for. Um, are you are you getting the, the image? Hello. Uh, yeah, we can see uh, your presentation slides fine. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. And um, first of all, I will give you one short presentation of what is Techno Veritas, and then we'll speak about uh, cracking the numbers. Um, so, Tetas, 25 years old company that has been specialized on uh, fleet performance and energy performance, and uh, finally uh, develop their own uh, products. Um, one of the main uh, things uh, resulted from these 25 years of uh, research and development for the marine. Uh, industry was the the, uh, the the Sea Trade Awards 2012 for the clean shipping, and then the Green Project Awards uh, for uh, with our fuel, water, emulsions to control emissions uh, from onboard ships. Um, we have um, uh, an extensive, um, um, how to say, um, proficiency on this as uh, we have uh, on, uh, developed our own ultrasonic uh, hardware that is adjusting the water uh, content to the engine load that is very important. So it is an inline system. Uh, um, so we have done uh, a number of uh, conversions of marine diesel engines like these ones that are Vartzilla's 9L32 uh, to work with natural gas. We also develop uh, some um, electronics for ourselves, like our EDS for engines condition monitoring, um, that exports uh, the files and reports to shore via our BOEM platform we will be talking about. And we have our uh, sharp um, torque and thrust meter uh, that is um, installed on board um, about 120 vessels with very good results and um, as the speaker before uh, with the equally good results from um, from the field. So um, finally um, we can say that uh, we have uh, developed a number of tools for energy efficiency and also for um, um, uh, fleet performance, and these um, these tools are namely the voyage performance using VEO, voyage energy efficiency optimizer, 
and Bowen, that is a cloud platform that connects uh, the ship to shore, but has a very interesting um, um, characteristic is that it um, cracks the numbers. Okay, so all these um, nice graphs that we have seen until now, they have a lot of uh, uh, knowledge behind and need to have um, a, a something they should not be a further burden to the to the crew and a further burden to people ashore to do the the interpretation of uh, such uh, quantities of numbers then uh, we have um, hull and um, performance main engines performance maintenance performance and also main engines and systems performance a very interesting uh, um, um, key information is that about 35% uh, only about 35% of the fuel that um, uh, a vessel is burning is useful. Typically, about 70% of the energy is wasted um, into the sea or into the um, to the environment. So, one other interesting point is that information um, uh, by definition is the knowledge communicated or received concerning a particular fact or, or circumstance. So, BOEM is very much um, doing uh, the filtering and comparing comparable things, okay? So, um, VEO is a system that is on board, has a dashboard for the crew uh, uh, to, that creates the crew awareness and is sending data to BOEMS that is cracking the numbers and delivering uh, customized um, customized reports to each person inside of an organization. So this means that um, each person does not need to dig into the big data, into the big data um, databases looking for their own um, uh, for their own uh, data, but the data is already, um, say, minced, is cracked, and is presented in the, in the report uh, form as the person wishes to have. So uh, BOEM is preparing reports for the for the CEOs, for the administration boards, is preparing um, reports for the ship. Uh, fleet managers and also for the uh, uh, superintendents, for the ship superintendents. So each one has their own um, um, customized uh, report, as they wish, not as we wish, as the clients wish. So, um, yeah, so we need to have a dashboard uh, to track some key metrics and um, we should not ignore data. So all the data that is collected, um, it is important for us, and um, the accuracy, it is also very important for us. Fleets generate big data. In fact, most of the vessels nowadays are uh, data generators. So they are fully automated, have plenty of automated systems that can generate data, but this data um, many times um, is not um, digested by uh, by the ship crew because they have lots of reports to do, lots of other things to do, um, and uh, also ashore, one superintendent that is dealing with five or uh, six ships, very just with a big effort can digest the very basic data. So there is always a lot of data that is not, um, has information but is not being transformed into uh, something valuable for the organization. So in fact, most of the companies, what they know is just the tip of the iceberg. The rest, it is um, literally lost. Okay, uh, one uh, very interesting um, definition is what is big data. So big data is um, uh, a structured, semi-structured, unstructured data 
that has some information in it. And uh, this usually is what creates a sort of deception to people uh, as they, they see so, so many numbers that in fact um, they cannot extract the information that is required out of it. So data is a company resource and is a resource on its own. Uh, what is big data good for? So it contains relevant information to uh, to the shipping company. So Boehm and VO are or became um, uh, a business assurance uh, products. Okay, so they because they cover um, um, the company performance in all aspects even on the optimization, uh, financial op optimization of a voyage. So fast and accurate data uh, makes people to decide wisely and uh, on time. So intelligent operation of uh, your productive system, of the ships, of um, the, the workshops ashore, uh, um, the involvement of, of all processes of the company. So this is very important um, to make sure that uh, spare parts are available at time, at the right time. Uh, for example, uh, using uh, VEO and BOEM, we can also do condition-based and predictive maintenance, like turbocharger, main engine, or auxiliary generators, turbocharger efficiency monitoring, predict failures before they happen. Uh, etc. Okay. So we know um, uh, this guy is the typical uh, ship superintendent um, that is always looking at the clock. So Boehm works uh, uh, 24 over 24 hours for this fellow. So instead of being uh, of um, uh, wasting time cracking the numbers and making calculations so Boehm can do all this for the superintendents and for the CEOs, for everybody inside of the company, of the shipping company. So it works 24 over 24 hours um, and um, in fact um, the, the information is processed on time. Uh, so um, and this processed as the 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 customer wants, so with care and accuracy. Uh, and it is delivered to the right persons on time. So this is something that is very, very important and it, these are some of the reasons why this is not well understood. Um, so uh, in fact, um, humans, humans have a, a special, uh, uh, have a limit to digest data and uh, this cube uh, is just uh, showing that every every person inside of, an, of one uh, uh, organization has their own interests in data. Uh, so changing mindsets, it is uh, something that is uh, very, very important. Um, so um, people on board tend to look at these systems as, um, as uh, the big brother. Um, they, they need to be uh, educated and to understand that um, the, the, the organizations compete in a wild business environment, so it is very important to, to run their operations with efficiency. Um, generation on board and the big data. So, um, main reasons for people on board uh, not not to treat properly the data is that people on board are too busy, are small crews, the crews are even from just um, um, becoming smaller and smaller, crews are, uh, crew members are not adequately trained um, and uh, they may be not uh, really interested as they think that uh, this um, is uh, something that is spying their their, their uh, professional, um, say, uh, operation. So, um, also one uh, important 
important uh, fact is that vessel vessels operate under different weather conditions. So uh, VEO is taking care of weather conditions and is making uh, uh, the, the ship performance uh, based on uh, weather conditions and corrections uh, that are uh, well uh, established. So, um, in fact, uh, BOEM is uh, producing not only the reports but is also the um, ship performance analyst uh, for um, for you. Okay, vessels performance in a wide concept um, uh, that is dependent on um, human behavior, marine environment, market environment, and technology level. So, how to implement one such system? First of all, we need to select which are the systems that, in fact, um, um, control the ship performance, which are the variables of each system, and which are the conditions that we want to monitor. Then, um, once this is set, it is uh, the next step, it will be the collection, so from where and which is the frequency, because data transfer to, to, to shore may be quite expensive even today. The process is to valorize the data that we get. So, valorizing data, calculate it, and filter it. These three uh, sub-steps uh, need to be um, uh, very well chosen for to get the, the best out of, uh, of one such system. Then, exploit the identification, interpretation, comparison, distribution, and proofing and then predict the forecast. So, BOEM, with BOEM, we can predict the ship performance up to one year, sometimes even more if the, the, the ship is doing regular, um, uh, regular voyages. Uh, this means that, for example, if somebody wants to predict when is the, the, the best time or if it is the time to clean the hull, they can come and uh, can see when when this is going to happen, that the that threshold that will make them to uh, to decide to clean the hull. So you can impose also your limits and say, okay, anytime my my the resistance of my ship is above a certain value, I will I I want to be uh, warned that this is uh, happening, and um, three months before that limit. So, they can arrange for cleaning the hull uh, in, in time. So, this is called anticipation and proaction. And here is where ship owners may make a lot of money. Um, uh, the system may be, um, may, may be typically updating the, the owner ashore at three minutes, all three minutes, and this is about one megabyte per hour. So, Definition uh, of key variables that affect the system performance, selection of a minimum uh, va number of variables that, uh, that give the information, um, how the variation of these variables affect the system performance, and monitoring conditions, to define the monitoring conditions, which are the variables allowable range to operate the system with acceptable performance, and then definition of alarms, and how uh, to interpret the variation of variables. So, um, uh, using this um, uh, association, VEO, BOEM, and OptiPower, the, the shaft uh, torque and thrust meter, uh, we can um, um, virtually control the ship performance um, in a very close uh, and uh, um, actual way. So, um, we have VO on board for data acquisition and uh, uh, crew awareness, and also uh, BOEM uh, for uh, business assurance, uh, linking the ship to shore. Um, only for, uh, based on the operations uh, of the crew, uh, we have seen um, few um, savings between 5 and 10%. Uh, only uh, by good practice board. 
the systems are approved by uh, ABS and also by NATO. So we have these systems already on board the um, naval vessels, frigates, and um, and also on board uh, some um, passenger vessels uh, with very very interesting results. Especially uh, when uh, when the ships like um, naval vessels uh, have two propellers and uh, they may have one propeller delivering uh, more thrust than the other one. Uh, so um, you know we have a the, a number of um, of dashboards that allow uh, people on the fly to correct the, these uh, these problems uh, by adjusting the pitch or the RPMs. So um, regarding this um, VO and uh, BOEM, uh, the systems are full compliant with the next IMO mandatory regulations for the MRV and also for um, the carbon. Um, and also for ECA and SECA um, 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 areas, so uh, they can see, um, they can log uh, and change the doing the, the field changeover, and the system will start um, will perform the um, the report of um, of field changing over um, when they they go inside uh, the ECA area. How much uh, diesel oil was spent, uh, latitude, so the position of the, the ship, latitude, longitude, and time. All this is um, uh, properly logged in the report. We have also specially dashboards for main propulsion, shaft power, electrical power production for generators, especially for big container ships and um, other vessels, um, for, for steam boiler. Um, or the thermal oil boilers for the cargo systems, mainly uh, tankers, and um, so uh, it is um, customized to, to, to each vessel. Uh, the system configuration schematic is quite simple, so we have typically um, um, as many um, uh, monitors uh, as we wish. We are acquiring um, the speed log, GPS, wind, and direction. Uh, so, as these are fundamental and draft as well, as these uh, are fundamental for the for the ship performance correction. Here it is, one of the, the dashboards. It is on the on the bridge. Uh, this has no human intervention, so people uh, doesn't need to click here or there, uh, except to put some notes if, uh, for example, when uh, uh, there is one, if there is one uh, engine uh, failure or something like that that need to be uh, commented. Um, also, we have this um, uh, optimization of trim through the, the through thrust and, um, and fuel consumption, uh, the voyage reports, echo reports, so the idea, so, so uh, we have an um, anti-pilfering system, so uh, nobody can steal fuel. This is something that has been very appreciated in some in some areas of the globe. So people cannot uh, steal fuel because uh, there is a, a fuel balance all the time. Um, also, we can assess the variables uh, history. So. Uh, what has been done before. Um, um, so, regarding the, the BOEM uh, features, we have all these features of so the technical management uh, with the fleet benchmarking, condition monitoring, performance prediction, voyage optimization, um, the maintenance uh, management with uh, all the maintenance tasks and also with um, with um, uh, spare parts management and predictive maintenance, and reports and documents. So all the manuals, etc. All the ship uh, documents, namely uh, certificates, may be um, um, on this platform. So the BOEM platform uh, organizes the ship 
as the people on board uh, have on their mind uh, with the monitor, with the uh, engine department and deck department. So um, all this, as you can see, uh, uh, it is organized according with uh, with uh, what is the the practice of the company. Um, clicking on uh, in front of each one of these red uh, lines, you get graphs for condition monitoring to what monitoring. Um, also, we have um, available a voyage optimization as the BOEM system is learning how the the, um, the ship behaves uh, at sea with a certain conditions. So the system has an, one expert. Uh, one expert system. Yeah, well, it is intelligent in terms of what is uh, in terms that it is learning how the ship is performing at this actual time with a certain co uh, weather conditions. So um, we can uh, optimize the speed, profile the route, etc. Voyage optimization. Uh, so this is more a, a sort of financial. Uh, voyage optimization. It is available uh, uh, by uh, to to the smartphones, and um, all the, these uh, reports um, come to uh, um, to the user via internet. So you may access your ship uh, performance anywhere uh, you have uh, an internet access. So um, we can. Um, uh, it is a standard tool to have uh, what I, I I told I mentioned before regarding the the prediction of uh, hull cleaning and the prediction of uh, increased uh, fuel consumption. So we know uh, using these um, these uh, tools when should we clean the hull uh, or when should we. Um, uh, um, how to say um, expect uh, a fuel consumption increase. What so these these uh, um, yellow and green um, uh, areas are limits that we are able to um, accept. Um, um, I'm going to skip this, but uh, just to mention that um, when uh, one vessel that has uh, the pitch, uh, the pitch schedule um, optimized for um, uh, a certain speed is now doing slow speed, uh, slow steaming uh, operation, and uh, just by adjusting the the pitch a little bit, uh, they they come to uh, a saving of 2,700 euros in 2.5 months. This is quite a lot of money after one year of operation. Um, one interesting thing for the ones that uh, like more uh, in terms of to have a more analytic uh, tool is that um, uh, this is the, the history of uh, fuel consumption of one vessel and also the thrust measurements uh, against the speed. And this is the filtered data um, showing the equation in the bottom. So, in fact, this is uh, the mathematical model of uh, of the specific fuel oil consumption of a certain vessel uh, that can be uh, used uh, to evaluate the ship performance in other conditions. So, the system is extracting also the equations that characterize the, the ship performance. Um, Okay, um, here was again um, when the pitch, uh, it is another example, with the pitch um, optimization um, that um, with the pitch optimization that resulted in the about 9% uh, of uh, um, efficiency increase. A very interesting KPI is the, the thrust developed by uh, kilowatt delivered to the propeller. Uh, this is a very interesting KPI. We can, uh, we usually 
work on KPIs to give a better understanding to the final client or user what is going on with the, with the vessel. And um, propeller efficiency again, the um, monitoring all along the time. Okay, so uh, VO and MOM offers their company all major fleet performance tools. So the um, we can um, we can empower companies to um, to manage the, the fleet performance. Um, it it has very intuitive dashboards uh, that are customized to to the users. Uh, so each user gets uh, its own um, its own uh, report, customized report. Okay, and uh, the, the the other aspect of these uh, products is that they do the calculation, um, um, and they they also act as experts in terms of what they are advising people to to do. So. Um, Using uh, BOEM, uh, you can access your fleet performance instantly. It is one affordable investment. Uh, the port of flexibility, um, adding more vessels or existing ones, or even uh, in uh, receiving data from other monitoring systems on board, it is possible. So we can uh, interconnect with the existing monitoring chips, uh, monitoring systems on board. Um, that may be installed. Benchmarking, it is also um, uh, possible and easy. And um, um, the question is uh, how to use this uh, in the most uh, efficient way. Uh, for a start, is to, to, to deliver, uh, to have exactly the number of, um, to know exactly the number of variables that we that characterize the ship operation, and to uh, go for um, how to say a modest system in terms of data acquisition, and then uh, growing, um, for example, uh, for more variables to complement um, to complement the reports or to investigate a more detailed um, uh, aspect of the fleet management. Um, so uh, BOEM receives the ship data, processes the data in the cloud, delivers personalized data in real-time basis to each uh, user, um, and has, uh, has a standard fleet performance uh, management, fleet condition monitoring, fleet maintenance management, documentation uh, management, report certificates, manuals and also uh, a voyage economic results simulator. Um, just to say that um, um, one extremely important thing on these are the flow meters, uh, but uh, the other very important um, uh, equipment here uh, or component of these systems is the, the OptiPower so the torque and thrust meter that are in fact the eyes of the system. So um, very important uh, piece of equipment to have on board. Thank you very much for your attention and um, I hope this has been uh, of interest to you all. Thank you. Great, thanks George. Uh, it's very insightful. and. Um, as was mentioned, if, if there's any questions, um, please put them into the chat feature. Um, we're going to move on to the, the question and answer session now, and I appreciate uh, that the fact that we've run out, uh, run over time um, by quite a bit. So we're, we're going to pose a few questions for the panelists, but um, if you do have to jump off the webinar, um, just please be aware that the record, the full recording of this webinar is going to be available on. FathomshippingEvents.com. Um, so if you do have to uh, leave us, then you can listen again um, just to the question and answer session at a later time, um, if you so wish. Um, 
We've received several questions for our panel of, of, of panel of speakers, so thanks for submitting them. Um, and so I'm, I'll kick off. My first question um, is for Stein um, from Yoten, and it's around um, the money back performance guarantees that, that Yoten offers. Um, and a question that's come in is, what are the performance parameters of the uh, of the guarantee uh, that 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 Yoten offers? Well, we basically look into a few given things on the vessel. We take the speed through water through the Doppler log, uh, and we link that to the power delivered from the engine measured by the torque meter. So we take both the RPM and the torque. Um, we have to correct for the draft because if the vessel is in balance or in loaded condition or in in between, we have to adjust this to the initial design curve that we use as a starting point. We also have to take the wind into consideration because if it's too heavy wind that will also affect the additional resistance for the ship through water. So anything of let's say before scale uh, five and upwards will be cancelled out but the rest we will keep. Um, and one thing to say is that this is not suitable for all types of vessels so it should be vessels only on a worldwide trade with relatively long hauls and not too frequent short stops. So Having all this into perspective uh, means we can we can then issue a guarantee. We can also then do the performance analysis, and this is all the same as you will find in the ISO standard 19030-2, the default standard. Great, thanks, Brian. And um, just just whilst you're um, off off mute, just a, a quick follow-up question uh, that that someone's also sent in about the, the this performance um, guarantee. Um, and that's how is how is this um, the offering of this guarantee impacted the uptake of uh, Yoten solutions? Well, I could, I could take the long answer, but the, the easy one is it has it. I think it, what people see is that we have confidence in what we're doing. You can always go around promising different things, but we have said that we are willing to pay back in cash if we do not perform. Uh, and even though not many have taken up the guarantee, a lot have said that because you're willing to put your head on the block like this, we truly believe in what you're doing and we therefore uh, sign up for the uh, for your concept with the product and the other, other services. Yes? Anything else, Catherine? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, Stein. Hello, sorry. Um, technical fault there. Um, my next question is for, for Edwin, actually, Stein. So, so um, you're off the hook for now. Um, and Edwin, are, are you? I'm, uh, I'm online. Yes. Hi. Okay, so um, Edwin, this question relates to something that was in your slide, um, and that's in the ferry example with the negative thrust. Why was the torque and the power still positive? Yeah, that's a good question, but because a lot of people don't know that the controllable pitch propeller can have a, a negative thrust when the propeller blades are still in forward position. So, for example, when you're sailing a certain speed, let's say 40 knots, and when you decrease the pitch of the propeller uh, a little bit fast, you will just generate negative thrust. So there's still power on the shaft, you still have torque on the shaft, but what the propeller is doing, it's uh, decreasing the, the, the ship speed very roughly, and also it can uh, have quite some cavitation, can, uh, result can be quite some uh, cavitation uh, at the propeller blades. And that's one of the advantages of a thrust meter, it will show you what is exactly what is uh, happening with the uh, propeller and what, uh, how the propeller performance is. And in this case, uh, when you have a controllable pitch propeller, it's very interesting because it can do different things than you expected. Great, thank you. And then um, just another question uh, for you, Edwin, um, and that is, can the TT sense show heavy running um, and light running of a propeller in different weather conditions? Uh, yeah, maybe you can switch over to my screen. I don't know if it's possible still. 
Um, we can try. I'm just letting the girls. I know. You should be able to. Not there. We go. Perfect. Yeah, this is a screen showing you uh, engine load diagram, and the engine load diagram is all about uh, heavy running propellers and light running propellers. So when you have, for example, a torque sensor, then you already are uh, capable of uh, having uh, quite some good indication of uh, heavy running propellers. Because what will happen when you have a heavy running propeller, this line over there, so that's uh, the propeller load curve, will just move a little bit to uh, the, the left upper corner. So then you have a heavy runner propeller, and for example, when this yellow point is over there, you, then you have an overloaded propeller, which can happen, for example, when you have a hull fouling, propeller fouling, or uh, during heavy weather. So already, when uh, looking at the, uh, the results, the measuring results of a torque sensor, you are able to uh, detect uh, heavy running or uh, maybe even uh, light running, but uh, most of the cases it will, will be heavy running. Perfect. Uh, great. Thank you, Edwin. Um, and then just uh, so that we can attempt to uh, wrap up um, by around half past three, I'm just going to um, pose a question to, to George. Um, George, are you there? Yes, yes. Perfect. Thanks. Um, uh, the question that's come in is um, around BOEMS, and as a, as a real-time decision support tool um, that, that, that uses the cloud, um, does it connect um, to the shore, and what are the connect connectivity requirements? Well, the connectivity requirements is just um, 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 a common internet uh, connection. So uh, anywhere you have uh, internet, you can uh, get the BOEM running because uh, it is a site so each client has their own uh, each client and each user of a client has um, uh, how to say uh, a password and uh, so uh, it requires a satellite or if the ship has no satellite it can be 3G connection or Wi-Fi. So we have uh, uh, any time the ship is in port, most of them they have uh, uh, 3G or 4G um, internet connection. So the system uh, may be using this. Uh, some ports that are, are offering the Wi-Fi for the ship, so they have also uh, connection or at sea using the satellite. So this is um, uh, once once the ship is connected um, to um, how to say an internet uh, channel, uh, the users may be uh, benefiting from receiving this information, updated and uh, already mathematically treated and filtered. So all this is uh, automatic. So the the, the system is um, receiving data automatically as soon as it receives uh, or detects uh, 3G. So it is, uh, the system may identify if it is uh, preferably a Wi-Fi, secondly uh, a 3G or um, in last case a satellite connection. So uh, it can um, uh, switch from one to another. I don't know uh, if I, um, I, I responded uh, properly. But I believe yeah, no, that, that's great, George. Thank you very much. And um, for for all of these questions, for for all attendees, if there's um, anything that these um, the few questions that we we've put to the speakers have provoked, um, then please let us know. Um, you can email any further questions to events at fathom hyphen mi um, dot com, and we can connect you um, with the speakers and and, and get them answered. Um, but I think for for now, that's sadly um, going to be um, out of time for, for this webinar. And um, I'd like to thank our speakers um, from Yota and VAF Instruments and Techno Veritas for taking the time from their uh, busy schedules to present. And I'd also like to thank you all for joining this webinar. Um, as I mentioned uh, shortly, the, the, the recording link will be available on uh, fathomshippingevents.com. 
um, and, and, and Fathom hosts uh, a lot of free to attend conferences and webinars on a regular basis, uh, which we invite you to all attend. Um, our next conference, uh, which leads on quite nicely actually from the content of this webinar, uh, will be Smart Operations um, that will examine big data, ship connectivity and software applications. Um, and I'm sure hull, hull and propeller performance monitoring will, will be on the agenda for sure, as, as it usually is. Um, it, it's going to be hosted in Rotterdam on March the 8th. Um, and so if interested, please visit fathomshippingevents.com to find out more um, and indeed anything uh, for our upcoming events and, and the next webinar that uh, will be scheduled. Um, and I guess that's all, that, all that's left to say is any further questions, please email them to us. Um, and we look forward to uh, welcoming you to our next webinar. Thanks a lot.